Hello, welcome to the ACAP Recap. I am Erin Party, a physician associate and board member of the Academy of Physician Associates in Cardiology, or APAC. I am joined today by John Giacona, a fellow board member and PA, and we're going to discuss a recent conference he attended, the American Heart Association's Hypertension Scientific Sessions 2024. John, can you tell us a little bit about the conference? Yeah, so this this conference um, happens about once a year. And, um, you know, as a hypertension clinician, I feel like it's truly the highlight of the year for for me as well as for, you know, other hypertension researchers. Um, the really cool thing about this meeting in this conference is that it provides, you know, us with updates on cutting edge research and the latest clinical trial data. And it's it's really a unique place where experts, early career faculty and students can all network and share ideas and discuss, you know, what's coming down the pipeline and how to best manage um, hypertension. Wow, that's great. Sounds like you learned a lot. What was your favorite presentation and did you learn anything that would change your practice? Definitely. Thanks, Aaron, for that question. Um, I, so my favorite session was on actually primary aldosteronism. So most providers feel that primary aldosteronism is, is an uncommon um, disease However, it's 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 actually extremely common. It's the most common endocrine form of secondary hypertension. And there was a lot of time spent at this conference going over, you know, the detection, the diagnosis, and management of primary aldosteronism. And one of the key points made is that um, there's a real lack of screening for, for patients with primary aldosteronism. Um, it's somewhere around the percentage of 1% to 2% of those um, that meet the the requirements to be screened are actually getting screened. And so some of the highlights and some of the speakers, you know, pointed out that we really need to be more aggressive in our screening for uh, primary aldosteronism. Some of the patients that could benefit from screen screening, um, those with, you know, high pretest probability are those with resistant hypertension. You know, they're on three meds. One of them is a diuretic um, and they're uncontrolled. Or if they're on four meds and they're controlled, they should really all be screened for primary aldosteronism. Those with hypertension and hypokalemia, uh, spontaneous hypokalemia or diuretic-induced hypokalemia. Um, those with hypertension and incidentaloma, so adrenal um, you know, adenomas found um, or CT scans for other reasons. Um, those with hypertension and obstructive sleep apnea, um, or if they have a family history of early onset hypertension. All of those patients, uh, I think consensus, expert consensus is that they should really be screened for primary aldosteronism. The screening for primary aldosteronism is is a serial is not a serial but is a simultaneous measurement of plasma aldosterone concentration and plasma renin activity as well as a BMP because you want to check for potassium. Um, if your potassium is too low, that can actually inhibit aldosterone secretion and lead to to a, a missed opportunity in terms of diagnose, potentially diagnosing a patient. So repleting their potassium in that case is is of utmost importance. The other key point brought up in the conference is that screening for primary aldosteronism, many people might be reluctant because of medication inter interference, specifically spironolactone and other MRAs, um, thiazide diuretics, potassium, wasting diuretics. They can actually increase uh, um, renin. And so most of the time people are, you know, they're, they're sort of afraid to screen in these patients. However, because these drugs raise renin, it's actually better to go ahead and screen when you have them in the office the first time. Just do an initial screening um, because in the context of a suppressed renin, despite whatever medications they're using, raises the suspicion for primary aldosteronism. And you can always wash out these medications and rescreen later on. Um, it's just a really pragmatic approach it's a, it, and it's a really um, strong effort to try and increase screening in people that likely have primary aldosteronism. Wow, that is really interesting. I had no idea about all of the screening criteria. I think that will really help some people. Finding more of these patients so we can better treat them is an excellent path to take. Did you learn about any upcoming developments in this realm or clinical trial data that may be soon available? Yes, Aaron. Actually, there was a great discussion on the use and implementation of renal denervation, um, especially in the context of the AHA's recent scientific statement on renal denervation. Um, you know, it's 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 a new FDA-approved treatment for those with resistant hypertension. 
And I, and I think some of the key takeaways that would benefit most um, providers in cardiology is that the overall response rate and efficacy of renal denervation is quite variable and not uniform among all patients. Generally speaking, the reductions in both daytime um, ambulatory blood pressure and office systolic blood pressure was about 5%. And we had that response after three months of renal denervation in about 60 to 70% of patients. Um, so, I mean, if you think about it, that's essentially a, the same as adding a new antihypertensive. You can expect the same kind of response. The unfortunate part is that there really is no clinical feature in the current RCTs apart from a high baseline blood pressure that consistently associate with a greater response to renal denervation. So the, the AHA scientific statement kind of came up with a pragmatic way for us to, you know, assess and determine who should be getting renal denervation. So who, what type of patient um, should be getting this procedure? So um, renal denervation, the the type of patient that, that should be getting renal denervation really comes from the pathophysiology. And so what we're doing with renal denervation is we're going into the renal arteries and we're either using ultrasound or radiofrequency ablation to essentially heat up and burn the nerves, um, the afferent nerves and the efferent nerves that are in, integrated in the wall of the renal arteries. And by that, we can reduce sympathetic nerve activity. And so one of the things that's important in identifying a patient, even though the RCT data doesn't necessarily suggest this, we're basing this off of pathophysiology, is that those that have both combined systolic and diastolic hypertension. So really, you want to avoid people with just isolated systolic hypertension, which you commonly see in old, older patients. Um, and you really want to combine systolic and diastolic hypertension. Another important factor in that is that that needs to be be confirmed with out-of-office blood pressure. So we want to rule out secondary um, hypertension like white coat um, or mask, and we want to confirm that with 24-hour ambulatory or home blood pressure monitoring. Another group of patients that we see that could potentially benefit are those that are prescribed, you know, one to two meds, so they're not necessarily resistant, but they can't tolerate much higher doses of medications or additional medications. So they could have you know, a number of side effects at different classes, and they're only able to be on one or two. Like I said, the the reduction in blood pressure is similar to adding about one new medication. So in those patients, we could, we could potentially see um, a benefit in them. And then the most obvious answer would be adults with true resistant hypertension. So if they're on three meds, as I had mentioned earlier, that are um, uncontrolled, or if they're on four meds that are controlled or uncontrolled, they meet that definition renal denervation could be something that could benefit them in the long run. That's really great. Are there any patients that should not receive this procedure, such as patients that have kidney disease? Yes, there are some patients that you should avoid renal denervation in um, due, to, due to contraindication. And some of those I had mentioned are uh, secondary causes. So any secondary cause needs to be ruled out. And if they have that, then renal denervation is really not for them. You should treat the secondary cause. Um, at this moment, it's also not appropriate for pregnant adults or those with any any type of anatomical issue in the, in the renal artery because we are going into the renal artery to ablate. If they have something like fibromuscular dysplasia, a stented renal artery, renal artery aneurysm, or renal artery stenosis, then those patients would not be candidates uh, for, for uh, renal denervation. And like I had and like you had alluded to, those with you know stages four and five CKD uh, um, are not, are likely not good candidates. And um, I guess some other important factors are those with single kidneys or if they've had uh, you know kidney transplant. Those are all great things to consider. Thank you so much. That's a really interesting field, and uh, we're all excited to learn more about it as more and more data comes out. So what type of um, provider or what specialty provider uh, would most benefit from this conference? So my, my initial response is any person who cares for a patient that has a blood pressure. But in, in, re in reality, uh, I would say those in cardiology, nephrology, or endocrinology, because really hypertension is the interplay uh, between those three um, specialties. And so I think if you are in any of those specialties in APP, um, or a physician or a scientist researcher in any of those specialties, I think you would benefit. 
Um, the nice thing about the AHA conference is there are two tracks. There's a clinical, uh, there's a clinical track where most clinicians can, you know, get very pragmatic approaches to treating uh, uh, hypertension of different types. And there's also a basic science track. So if you're a wet lab scientist or a bench scientist, um, then you can gain a lot of insight there. And sprinkled in both both sides is is sort of population um, population research as well. So if you're an epidemiologist. Um, and you study chronic diseases, I think you would get a lot of benefit from this conference as well. Wow, that's great. There's a, a large breadth of people that can come and benefit from it. Is there any introductory information, like maybe for new grads or people new to cardiology, or is this more of a really deep dive into hypertension? There are some uh, there are some introductory so- sections because within the clinical section, we have a primary care sort of focused uh, set. We have some primary care focused sessions. And so if you're new to cardiology or you are a primary care provider and you really want to, you know, learn more about hypertension and how to better manage and treat your patients, um, there's room for for you as well. Wow, that's great. Do you know when the next conference is? Yes. The next conference is around the same time, September 4th through the 7th, 2025, and it will be in Baltimore, Maryland. Will you be there? I will certainly be there. Excellent. Excellent. Speaking of conferences, I wanted to let everybody know about our upcoming conference. That's APAC. We're putting on a conference called CAP. That's Cardiovascular Advanced Practice Providers. Our conference is going to be next month, October 17th through the 19th, 2024, at Red Rocks Resort in Las Vegas. We're offering a range of cardiology topics from valves to coronary syndrome, electrophysiology, cardiomyopathy, lipids, heart failure, POTS, cardiac devices. Our speakers will cover the most up-to-date guidelines, best practices, and things not to miss. As a cardiology provider, we hope to see you there. This has been an episode of the ACAP Recap. Thanks for listening. You can find this episode and more at HCP Live and on YouTube.